um such a pleasure and honor to have Anne Hermanstadt here uh, with us today. Um, and I am dying to li listen to your living histories. Please take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Sri, um, for the invitation and, and the opportunity to be here. Um, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about uh, where I am now um, before diving into uh, how I got here. So um, many people are familiar with the typical university setting and maybe what it looks like to be a professor, at least from the outside, in terms of balancing research and, and teaching and grant writing. Uh, my position is a little bit different. Um, so I work at a private nonprofit um, biomedical research uh, institute, Janelia Research Campus, um, that uh, is fully internally funded and funds basic curiosity-driven um, research. Um, and this, this research is funded on a, on a long time scale, um, and it supports um, ambitious, risky, long-term uh, projects. And so one of the things that we're working to understand is um, how the brain gives rise to flexible behavior. So how animals build internal models of the world, how they use these models to make decisions and to guide actions. And so one of the ways that um, we approach these problems is to develop um, like virtual reality video games um, for animals to play, um, animals like fruit flies. Um, and then we look inside the brain of these animals while they're playing these games. So here you're looking at uh, a neural activity um, in a fruit fly while it's it's uh, navigating in, in this VR uh, setup. And we try to understand how this activity relates to the models that flies are building as they're learning new things. And then we try to connect these to the underlying neural circuits the neurons and, and connections that give rise to this. Um, so uh, this still to me feels like science fiction, um, uh, even though this is what I, I work on every day. And if you had told me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that this is where I would be, I would never ever um, have believed you. Um, I, I came uh, from a small town uh, in Western Colorado. Um, it's a it's a fairly insular place and, and so uh, it was a, a long time later that I learned that growing up, I had a fairly uh, narrow view um, of, of the world. Um, as a kid, I loved uh, art uh, and I loved writing. Um, so when I got into uh, high school, I spent most of my time uh, doing art projects, writing essays, short stories. I took science classes, but I didn't really enjoy them. Biology was okay. Chemistry was a bit worse. And I, I really hated uh, physics. Um, and it was largely because uh, the, the courses, the way they were taught, uh, were based on memorization. Um, I didn't know any scientists in my life. I didn't know any scientists in the real world. So I had no idea that science was something that you could um, pursue. And so when I um, went to, uh, when I was uh, getting ready to graduate and thinking about uh, next steps, my family was very supportive about uh, me, me going to college. I wanted to go to college, but I didn't think of this as um, you know, me pursuing my passion, or I didn't think of, um, you know, being able to do anything that I wanted. Um, I thought of this as going on to sort of get an education, get a job, live a, a normal life, uh, whatever, whatever that means. Um, and so even though I loved art, I never considered doing that uh, as a career. This seemed completely impractical to me. So I decided um, I was going to pursue this thing called engineering. I had no idea what engineering was or what it meant to be an engineer, but it sounded very practical. Um, so I, I went to a small engineering school uh, in Colorado um, called the School of Mines. Um, and it was there that, uh, that three people really changed uh, my trajectory. So I had um, two professors, uh, one in physics, one in math, who recognized early on um, that I was I was quite good at uh, at both, and uh, they encouraged me to go into physics and help me restructure my entire um, course load uh, and and major. And then there was another student that um, I worked with throughout uh, my entire time at at Minds, um, who really helped me um, learn to think. Uh, in, in physics. And so um, I just became hooked. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I took all the classes that I could, undergraduate and, and graduate courses. Um, and then uh, as I approached my senior year, we, we had to do a senior design, a research uh, project. And, and I thought I wanted to go into uh, theoretical physics uh, research. And so I worked with the, the one theorist in, uh, in the department on, on Bose-Einstein condensation. Um, and I think it was a, a mix of the project and and the dynamics um, that uh, at the end of that year led me to think that research 
really might not be for me. I, I wasn't sure that I was well suited for this. And this um, made me really uncertain. Uh, I thought I wanted to go to graduate school, but I, after this experience, I wasn't sure that, that I did. Um, so I decided to apply um, for graduate school, but then I, I deferred for a year. I took a year away from science to kind of figure things out and think about whether this was the right, right thing to do. And so during that year, um, I did a few different things, but uh, one of those things was um, teaching English in, in Bolivia. So I moved down to Bolivia for some time. Um, I was um, pretty naive when I, um, when I went down. I sort of thought I could jump right in to this school, make a huge impact on, on these students, and then, and then you know, jump right out. Um, and uh, you know, I learned over the course of that year a lot about what it means to make an impact and to contribute to something uh, in, in a meaningful way. And I came back from that experience wanting to go back to school. So I wanted to go back to graduate school and I wanted to find a way to do something to contribute in some some meaningful way. And I did not know at all what that would look like, but uh, that's what I wanted to figure out. So um, so at this point I had, uh, I had graduated from college. I had moved down uh, to, um, to Bolivia for some time. And then I, I came back uh, um, uh, to the US um, uh, to do my graduate work in uh, in theoretical physics um, at uh, UC Santa Barbara. It was there that I joined a, a complex systems group um, uh, and learned about all of these fascinating systems, earthquakes, forest fires, financial networks, uh, immunology, uh, and, and, and the brain. Um, and so I started my PhD working on earthquake physics. And at the end of my PhD, I was thinking about uh, the human brain. Um, and it was during, during my PhD that my, I got my first taste of, of analyzing data. Um, and I remember sort of pulling out patterns in the data for the first time that other people hadn't seen before. Um, and it was the first time I remember feeling like I could contribute something to this enterprise, that I would have something unique to bear, um, on this and and that I would get to discover things, see things for the for the first time. Um, so this is when I got hooked on on research um, and I got interested in in pursuing neuroscience a longer term. So I I knew at that point I wanted to try and and do a postdoc um, in neuroscience. I had been studying the human brain at like a, a large scale how how brain regions interact with one another, and I realized I didn't understand what the brain was made up of, the cells that contribute to this activity, what communication in the brain meant. And so for my postdoc, I went from sort of studying the whole brain to thinking about sensory systems. So um, at this point, I, I split my time in my postdoc between Paris and, and Philadelphia. And I was thinking about how the brain makes sense of um, signals, sensory signals coming in. So when your eyes um, first detect photons or your nose uh, detects chemicals, how those signals are, are transformed into the electrical signals that your brain uses to communicate. Um, throughout my postdoc, I, I still really loved research, um, but I, uh, started to worry that science was not going to be the career for me, that I wasn't uh, fit for um, for this. And, and I think part of that came from um, not seeing myself or not thinking that I saw myself reflected in the scientists that I, I interacted with. Um, it seemed that there was a particular skill set, a particular way of communicating, a particular identity that exemplified a scientist, and I didn't feel like I, I fit that that mold. Um, and so I, I started to look um, for industry positions and um, towards the end of my postdoc, I, um, I was ready to accept an industry position and I decided that just before that I would try my hand at the academic job market um, and just see how things, how things went. Um, and they went, you know, much, much better than, than I expected. Um, and I, um, at the end of the process was very close to accepting a, a tenure track position at, at a university. Um, and at that point in time, I got invited to give a talk at, at Genelia, um, where I am now. Um, the talk turned into an interview, the interview turned into a, a job offer. And before I knew it, I had accepted um, uh, this position. And what really um, uh, appealed to me about it was this, um, this idea of taking on really big, risky, ambitious projects in a really collaborative um, interdisciplinary environment totally scared me. I was, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, but, but something about it was, was really intriguing and, and appealing. Um, and so I've, I've been there now seven years, um, have, have absolutely loved it. Um, the work that we're doing, the questions we're asking, um, but also the people that I get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are, um, these are all the people that make science amazing for me. I get to, to learn from them, um, be inspired by them, um, and this is part of what makes the job so uh, so amazing. Um, so stepping back, 
um, if I had to sort of give my my takeaways. Um, you know, I, I really, I never expected uh, I would be here. Um, and I never through, throughout this entire experience have felt that I'm well suited for this job, even, even now. Um, but I love it and I just keep doing it. Um, and so if I think back about, you know, what, what has helped me get to, to where I am, I think there are two things that, that resonate. Um, so one is, is being comfortable being a bit un uncomfortable. So if I had stopped in this journey when things got a bit difficult or outside of my comfort zone, I, I never I never would have gotten uh, here. Um, and the, the second is um, finding ways, embracing um, your own skills and perspectives that you can really bring to bear on, on uh, a problem or, or a field. Um, so for the longest time, I thought that the successful scientist looked a very specific way, um, had a very specific skill set. Um, and, and it's taken me a long time. And even now I sometimes uh, still struggle with, um, you know, the, the many different ways that people contribute to science and, and bring very different perspectives and, and uh, approaches to um, to this whole thing and it makes it what it is. So um, with that, uh, I'll, I'll stop and I'm, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, for a super interesting and inspiring talk. Um, audience, please feel free to send me your questions via chat and I will start by asking you, would you be able to unpack for us some of these uh, some of these exact would you be able to unpack for us some of these situations that gave you the impression that you are not the natural fit for science so who who yeah. in your mind was yeah no so I mean a, a lot of it and this is something um you know that that really developed over time I think slowly and and through lots of interactions um and you know part part of it is um and especially in the physics communities I was in, there was this sort of um, uh, really loud, in-your-face, uh, aggressive, uh, uh, at-the-board personality. Um, I am a I'm a slow thinker. Um, I uh, I like to simmer with things. I like to step back, and and I'm. Um, it takes me a while to really um, get to the heart of of what uh, connect with with a problem. Um, and so, in in these very vocal environments, um, it's it's easy to to feel lost, um, to feel lost in them, and and to not sort of be able to feel like you're contributing. And and so, I think this was one aspect of it that um, uh, I felt uh, that you know I wasn't wasn't right for um for that that you had to be of, of that type of personality and uh um sort of uh aggressively at the board um to be a true a true physicist and 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 to um uh to be in the center prize and, and so appreciating sort of the um yeah the the slow the slow simmery parts um that's where i that's where i sit um, and that's where I do my best thinking and, and my best work. But it's really hard to see that you don't see other people. You don't see that actively. That's a very passive, uh, passive thing. So that's maybe one example. Wow. Thank you. Uh, following up with a question about the panoramic landscapes that you showed as, <laughs> you know, uh, these signature photos from where you grew up, uh, I'm aware that uh, you know, there are places with more mountains in Colorado, <laughs> right? But even then, this is a, this is a, this is a very scenic place to grow up in. And did that affect the aesthetic of the work you do? Ooh, interesting. I mean, growing up, I thought the desert was so ugly. Um, and now I think it's absolutely breathtaking so going back I can't believe I thought that growing up I mean there there was a sense of you know m most of the people that I went to school with um stayed stayed there um still still are there um it's a really um uh n not a lot of people um move move outside and and so um I think I was affected by feeling you know so some worry that I I wouldn't 
I wouldn't get out. I wouldn't go experience uh, some of the rest of, of the world. And so it's, it's hard to decouple some of that. But in terms of the um, aesthetics, um, I mean, I have a deep love for rocks. So that's that's something that came from from all the beautiful rocks in, in Colorado. Um, but uh, uh, certainly the landscape, the, the places I've gotten to live in um, uh, are uh, sort of have, have an immense natural beauty that um, I'm sure implicitly at least factors into um, how I think about science. Uh, thank you. Final question before I wrap. Um, you talked about, you know, standing your ground when things get a little bit uncomfortable, um, hanging in there. Any quick formulae you care to share for how to do that? Yeah, so um, oh, how to do that? I mean, so uh, I, I didn't even realize that that I was doing this necessarily until I, I talked to other people who would describe science as as just easy. You know, it, it made sense. I always I always fit here. This was always this this just was the easy path, and it made sense. And for me, it, that's it's just never felt that way. Um, it always felt like I was pushing outside of my comfort zone. And and so part of I think there's there's an appeal um, of that to me. I think um, a while back I became curious if I pushed myself, how far could I go? And it was a very personal, you know, I wanted to know, you know, if, if I just pushed a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more outside of my comfort zone, what, what could I do? And, and that became, I think, a, a process in and of itself that I um, was drawn to. And so at this point, I don't know any other, I don't know any other way. Um, and so it's just a constant, it's just a constant feeling of slight discomfort, but, um, I think that's, that's led me to try things that, uh, I, I wouldn't otherwise have, um, and to take on things that I think like, ah, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. And I'm, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to do this, but let me try. And the worst thing is you fail. And, and I've got, you know, how bad is that in the end? So I, I think that's, that's, uh, um, part of the, the mentality that uh, I sort of happily live with it at this point. On that inspiring note, thank you again. Closing the recording.